All right. Good evening. Welcome, everybody. My name is Sydney Williams, and I am your host here for the Hiking My Feelings virtual campfire. This is night number two, and we are here live at the Reggae Ranch out in Julian, California, nestled on nine acres in the Cuyamaca Mountains. This is the future home of the Hiking My Feelings Wilderness Wellness Center. That is why we're all gathered here for the next 20, well, next 18 nights now after tonight um, to raise money for the wellness center. So what is the campfire? It is a combination of inspirational campfire chats, uplifting musical performances and other artistry, and some introductions to the Hiking My Feelings family, as well as my virtual book tour. So we were on track to go hike 220 miles around the city of Chicago this week um, for the next 20 days, but clearly that isn't happening because of COVID-19. So we decided to host a virtual campfire in the meantime to raise money for our Wilderness Wellness Center, bring good vibes, and just bring some hope and inspiration in these weird times that we're living through right now. So. Um, tonight we have a bunch of really great guests. Up first we have Linda Rubin. Linda is Adam's mom. Adam is one of my friends who passed away in 2014 and chapter one that I'll be reading from tonight is named after him. He is um, a former skydiver, former base jumper, um, and was one of my closest friends. So uh, we'll be starting with Adam's mom tonight. After that, um, Sensi Trails will be bringing a bunch of great music to us. They just had a video, um, their single Just Live In, the video for that hit a million views over the holiday weekend. So we are just so stoked to have them here this um, today and excited to have them joining us. And we also have Christine Sherinian, who is one of my BFFs. She attempted the Trans Catalina Trail in one day. So we're gonna talk about that tonight as well. And if you're new here, if you don't know who I am, my name is Sydney Williams. I'm the founder and author of Hiking My Feelings. And before I started doing this, I used to work in corporate America. I was a marketing person. I was sad, sick, tired, burned out. And when I got diagnosed with type 2 diabetes in December or September 2017, um, it was a huge catalyst for change in my life. So everything that you see here today is about hiking, healing, um, mindfulness, wellness in nature, and that's what we're all about. So we're just here to bring healing, hope, and inspiration, and we're excited to have you with us. Um, one fundraising update that I did want to share. So our first goal is $30,000. That's what we need to start phase one of construction on the Hiking My Feelings Wilderness Wellness Center. Um, in the next few days and weeks, we'll be sharing more about what that is, the vision for it, um, the actual renderings of what we're building. We'll have all of that for you to see. And I wanted to share that towards that first goal, as of right now, um, as of our tally last night, We've raised $6,317 of that 30K that we need to get started. So we're cruising right along. Um, if you're joining us on YouTube, we would love to have you um, donate. So you can do that at hikingmyfeelings.org slash give. Um, a couple bucks here and there would be awesome. It's gonna help us get this thing going. So um, before we jump in with all of our guests, I'm gonna read the chapter from the book today. So we are on chapter one. If you're following along, this is gonna be on page 25. Chapter one is called, You Only Get So Many Sunsets. Sydney, my husband Barry called out as he was making his way down the narrow hallway from our bedroom toward the kitchen. Our puggle Jezebel was following closely behind. She made a racket as she trotted behind him, her nails tapping on the linoleum. I made a mental note to trim her nails on our next day off. I was mindlessly scanning the contents of the refrigerator, trying to find something to eat before we went to work. Yeah? I responded, still looking through the fridge. I have some bad news, he paused. I held my breath, feeling time slow down and my chest start to tighten as I waited for him to finish. The pause felt like an entire lifetime, adrenaline coursing through my veins. Chris killed himself, he continued. Time stood still. Everything moved in slow motion. I was holding my breath, but now I felt like I couldn't breathe at all. I stood up straight and closed the refrigerator door, feeling the cold air whoosh out on my shins and squish shut. I reluctantly turned towards Barry. Are you serious? I asked, hoping it wasn't true and that I misheard him. He nodded, yes. My breath came back as a labored exhale and I crumpled into a pile on the floor. The light blue linoleum was cold on my bare legs, sending a chill through my entire body and taking my breath away again once more. I looked up at Barry, my eyes wide with disbelief. I couldn't find words. I was choking on the tears that were threatening to erupt from my eyes. While I was on a pile on the floor, Jezebel started licking my face and hopping all over me. Barry knew I wasn't getting up anytime soon and sat on the floor with me and held me. The second his arms were around me, all of my defenses came down and I started wailing, sobbing heavily, gasping for breath. Soon enough, both of us were crying. As I sat there shaking on the floor in Barry's arms, my life with Chris flashed before my eyes. 
The summer of 2013 was when we met Chris. I was working at a skydiving center running PR events and marketing while also a member of a competitive skydiving team. Barry was running the skydiving school and was in charge of the accelerated free fall, also known as AFF program, a training program that leads to you earning your USPA <laughs> A license, which allows you to jump by yourself without being attached to an instructor. It was a typical high desert summer day. I had locked myself in my office trying to get ahead of today's mission to stay cool as the temperatures climbed above 100 degrees. When three surfers bumbled into the office at the skydiving center, ready to start the student training progression, it was a storm of good energy. They came in cracking jokes, complimenting the young women who worked in the office, and their laughter was infectious. I peeked out of my office to assess the shenanigans that were evolving at the customer service desk. Craig seemed to be the more serious of the three. Hang on just a moment. Craig seemed to be the more serious of the three, but that wasn't saying much. He was an average height, stocky build, and had a deep tan and salt and pepper hair. The deep tan could be attributed to his work as a boat captain, and when he wasn't doing that, he was body surfing at the Wedge, an iconic surf spot in Newport Beach. John, who insisted we called him Potato, was a rabble rouser. Clearly the class clown for all of his life, Potato had an easy demeanor about him. He had a farm, pistachios and lavender, and when it wasn't harvesting time, he was also surfing the Wedge, and now jumping out of planes. Finally, Chris. Early 40s, slender build, kind eyes, and a smile that would lift the energy of any person, place, or animal in his proximity. Chris was an army veteran, an intelligence officer, who spoke several different languages and traveled around the world, including multiple tours through Iran and Iraq. <coughs> Before receiving an honorable discharge in July of 2013, he had just gotten home when he, Craig, and Potato surfed into our lives and onto the drops Zone. Chris earned his jump wings in the army but had to go through the progression to earn his civilian skydiving license. Barry taught them all how to skydive that summer and we were all fast friends. I was training for the USPA national skydiving competition with my team that year and when the guys got their licenses they told me that they were also starting a skydiving team. Blue skies and tube rides, a nod to their surfing roots and a newfound love for the sky and they asked me to be their coach. It was more of an honorary title than anything else but the guys started calling me coach. He also started calling Barry Chandler, a character from North Shore, a cult classic sur surfing movie. Chandler was an ever patient, incredibly wise soul surfer who surfed for the love of it, not for the fame. We were no longer Sydney and Barry, we were Coach and Chandler. After a summer of jumping out of planes, Barry and I visited Chris in Newport Beach with plans to explore the area, have some drinks and stay the night. We rode bikes around Balboa Island and the Three Musketeers showed us all of their favorite spots. We ended up at Cassidy's, a local watering hole where they spent a lot of their time in the summer. Their grilled cheese is out of this world, Chris told me when we saddled up to the bar. After he ordered his food, I followed suit and ordered a grilled cheese with bacon and avocado. When our food arrived, Chris peeled off the top piece of bread and smothered it in pepper plant original hot sauce. I did the same, committing myself to a lifetime of needing this soft sauce on everything I ate from that point forward. The conversation was easy, talking about everything and nothing at all, sharing stories of our travels, chowing down on grilled cheese and rum drinks. Chris made me feel seen. When he asked questions, he wanted to know what you had to say, and he listened to understand, not to calculate a response. I was drawn to his energy like a moth to a flame. Anyone who could make me laugh as hard and as often as Chris made me laugh was okay in my book. The five of us had been friends for only a few months at that point, but I knew in my heart that we had been friends for lifetimes before this. Sometimes you meet people and you're like, ooh, I found you. That's how Barry and I felt about these fellas. After we finished our sandwiches, we pulled into the photo booth like a bunch of teenagers and struck some silly poses before returning to our bikes for the ride back to Chris's condo. Despite having a few too many cocktails, we made it home safe and sound and I was out like a light the second my head hit the pillow. I woke up in the middle of the night to Barry tapping me on the shoulder, rousing me from a drunken slumber with blood running down the side of his head. What happened? I started screaming and crying. Chris and I went out for a nightcap after you fell asleep. We were crossing the street and I got hit by a car. They were in the crosswalk, walking their bikes across the street a few blocks from the condo. A drunk driver ran a red light and clipped Barry, sending him onto the bike, sending him and the bike onto the hood of the car, rolling onto the windshield and over the back of the vehicle. By some miracle, the gash on his head and a rolled ankle were his only injuries, so he declined an ambulance ride to the hospital. I lost it. I was angry that they went out after I fell asleep, terrified about the sight in front of me, and thankful that it wasn't worse, because my phone was on silent and charging on the other side of the room. If they needed me, I wouldn't have known. I was dead to the world when they rolled in. My mind started racing, envisioning the worst case scenarios. 
I'll never forget the look in Chris's eyes. He was scared, apologizing profusely, and felt responsible. It was his idea to go back out. Coming back to the cold linoleum floor as my little mind movie came to an end, it broke my heart that one of my most vibrant memories of Chris was him looking so terrified. The rest of that morning was a blur. Barry peeled me off the floor and we drove to the drop zone in a daze, listening to Ministry's cover of What a Wonderful World. I cried all the way to the work, all the way to work, and by the time I walked into the office, my face was red, swollen, and I was having a hard time breathing through my stuffy nose. I walked past my boss, who was also my mentor in the sport, my skydiving coach, and a member of my skydiving team, a personal friend of mine and Barry's. He asked what was wrong. Chris killed himself last night, I said through tears, still shocked by the words as they crossed my lips. Now it was real. Why are you so upset? It's not like you knew him for very long. Suicide is selfish anyway, he said turning on a dime, leaving me in a puddle of my own tears. I was a ball of fury, rage, denial, pain, and grief. January 18th was the day, 2014 was the day that Chris took his own life, and I had no idea what kind of battle he had been facing. The Chris I knew made me laugh so hard I cried, connected with total strangers the way I always had, and cared deeply about the people in his life. He was one of the brightest lights in our lives at the time, and the fact that he took his own life had me perplexed. How is this possible? I was searching for answers, for stories about Chris, anything that could help me wrap, around, wrap my head around why this brilliant, beautiful man would even consider suicide, let alone follow through. I connected with an old friend of his, Anthony, who wrote a beautiful story for OC Weekly and Maui Time about Chris's life and his passing. In reading the story that Anthony shared, I learned that Chris applied for mental health benefits with the VA in mid-September after he was discharged, and the process was brutal. He was going to the VA often, sometimes multiple times per week to try to get help. The VA doctors prescribed him the antidepressants citalopram and trazodone. In late December, an acupuncturist helped him connect some of the dots between what was happening in his mind, in his mind and body and told him he had fibromyalgia brought on by PTSD. He had been having violent nightmares and in January, he started undergoing sleep tests. Before his death, Chris filed, decided to file for disability with the VA for PTSD. If accepted, they would pay for his medical care for the rest of his life. The filing process required that he outlined every excruciating detail of every event that may have contributed to his PTSD while he was serving. Just two days after filling out those forms, Chris killed himself. January 19th, 2014, the day after Chris ended his life, was the first domino to fall, sending me on a spiral of trauma, loss, and a seemingly never-ending grief cycle. Chris's memorial was scheduled to take place during a training camp with my skydiving team. We had a new teammate this year, a woman traveling from Oregon to train with us. I told the team that I wanted to go to Chris's memorial, but my coach insisted that I had a commitment to the team and reminded me that my teammate had already booked travel for this training camp. I chose to train instead of going to his memorial. I regret that choice every day. At 10 a.m., when Chris's memorial paddle, up, paddle out was scheduled to start at the Wedge in Newport Beach, I was in a Cessna caravan, climbing to jumping altitude some 12,000 feet above the ground. My wrist-mounted altimeter had a watch function on it, and I stared at it from the second we got in the plane until the second it turned from 9.59 to 10 a.m. My coach told me to focus, to concentrate on the skydive, to prepare for the jump we were about to do. I ignored him and looked at the clock. If I wasn't at the memorial, I wasn't going to miss the moment of silence. Instead of visualizing the skydive, I visualized being part of the paddle out. I imagined Chris carving through huge waves with nothing but his body. I saw him laughing, sharing stories, gesticulating wildly. I landed from that skydive and ran to check my phone. Barry was at the memorial and he said he'd be sending pictures and telling me every single detail so I could feel like I was there. He sent a few texts with pictures of the paddle out and a few videos showing me how nearly 100 surfers were kicking and paddling and splashing in the water to honor their fallen friend. My coach came into the room and asked what I was doing. I rushed to hide my phone like a scared little girl and ran out to the bathroom to cry. When I sat down on the toilet, I screamed silently into my arm, tears free falling from my face. I swore to myself in that moment that if I ever had to choose between my team and my friends ever again, that I would choose my friends without question. On May 9th, 2014, I got a call from my dad. My uncle Mike had passed away peacefully in his sleep. In the years leading up to his death, however, his life was anything but peaceful. My uncle was a gay man, born and raised in Kansas City in the 50s and 60s. He was a singer, actor, entrepreneur, designer, and creator. He was the personification of love. By the time I was old enough to understand who he was to me, 
He was splitting his time between New York and San Francisco. He had found two amazing communities on the coast that were much more welcoming than where he grew up in Kansas. One of my most vivid memories with my uncle was when he showed me pictures from Burning Man. He and his creative cohorts had a camp there for years. And when he showed me pictures from one of his art installations, I thought it was fake. There was no way that this much art, these many people dressed in so many creative costumes, surrounded by this black ca blank canvas of desert dust. Some Growing up in the suburbs of Kansas City, I hadn't seen deserts before. I didn't know that Burning Man was real. I just thought my uncle liked dressing up and digitally manipulating pictures. After I moved to Southern California in 2011, my uncle was diagnosed with brain cancer. He had an inoperable glioblastoma and they gave him a couple of years to live, tops. He beat brain cancer the first time. And when I saw him at my grandmother's funeral in 2012, I was old enough to understand what that meant. I knew he, I was standing in the presence of a medical miracle. The therapies they had done and the tumor itself had impacted his speaking and singing voice. And it was heartbreaking to hear him try to find the words that had so effortless, effortlessly floated from his lips for decades prior. Even though his voice wasn't what it once was, it was still beautiful. I found out that his memorial would be happening at my cousin's house in Kansas, so I asked my family what their plans were. They couldn't afford to go, so they weren't planning to attend. All of my money was going to rent, student loans, food, insurance, and team training. I didn't want to go without my family, so I passed on the opportunity to celebrate my uncle's life. The weekend before my uncle's memorial, one of my teammates injured herself on a training jump. We didn't think that she would heal in time, so we didn't seek a replacement flyer to train with us for the National Skydiving Championships later that year. It rocked my world because we were on fire. Our training so far had been going really well, and it looked like we could potentially earn a medal at Nationals. I had invested so much time, energy, and money into this team and into developing my individual skills that when an injury effectively rendered our season over, I was crushed. I was also secretly relieved because after my coach's comment about Chris, my patient was with him was wearing thin. We ceased our training and I had to reckon with my own demons. Was skydiving worth the risk? Was team training worth the investment? I was pissed at my teammate for getting injured. I couldn't even look at her. It was the dumbest mistake on her part, one that most definitely could have been avoided, and I was still reeling from losing Chris and my uncle. On top of that, I was furious because I had skipped Uncle Mike's funeral or memorial because I didn't have the money. If I had known that she was going to get injured and that I wouldn't be paying for training later that month, I could have gone. Of course, that's not something I could have predicted, but I berated myself for years not knowing better. Aside from my marriage, skydiving was one of the only areas of my life that felt like it was going right, that I could count on, that I could pour myself into. Now that the rug had been ripped out, now that rug had been ripped out from underneath me. I'm a silver lining kind of gal. So when I got, so once I got over my petty temper tantrum, I held on to hope that she would recover in time for us to compete. We had worked so hard and we were having so much fun. I still wanted to see that through. On August 2nd, 2014, I woke up ahead of my alarm and started scrolling mindlessly through Facebook. I saw my friend Eric had changed his Facebook picture to be a photo of him and my friend Adam. Another friend posted on Adam's wall. All of the hair stood up on the back of my neck and I started to panic. There was a strange phenomenon in the skydiving community that when people died, everyone changed their Facebook profile to a black square to indicate that someone close to them had died. This wasn't a black square, but considering that Adam was in Idaho on a base jumping trip, it felt like I got socked in the stomach and my anxious brain started to assume the worst. It was early in the morning, but I sent Adam a message at 5.57 a.m., hoping he'd respond and put my worries to rest. How's everything going? Miss your face. Nationals, here we come. I scrolled up to see our previous messages to each other. July 22nd, 2014, 11.01 p.m. Adam. What's up, miss? How's the chalet and the dogs doing? July 23rd, 2014, 9.21 a.m. Me. They be good. How are you? Busy jumping off stuff? July 23rd, 2014, 12.58 p.m. Adam. Yeah, pretty much. I got an offer to help Tom A's first jump course packing and help the other coaches in the school. I'll be getting flown to Idaho five to ten times a year and in return learn a ton about rigging and staying alive in the sport. I didn't respond to that message. I was probably busy at work and forgot, but the part about staying alive in the sport made me feel like I was going to vomit. Our most recent messages were from July 28th. He was asking about how many jumps he could make in a day because he needed to do a certain amount of jumps in a specific time window and was trying to figure out where he could get the most jumps in, at the skydiving center where I worked or somewhere else. I had responded, but I was short. I didn't ask him what the goal was. I just gave him the answer he was looking for. It was Saturday morning and we opened early on the weekends, so I got in the shower and started to get my stuff together for a day on the drop zone. In the shower, I started to feel really sick and I needed answers. 
When I got out, I sent Eric a message at 6.51 a.m. I hate that I'm asking because it's fucking ridiculous how Facebook has washed my brain. But is Adam okay? I saw your pic with him and Dojo posted his posted to his wall and I'm hoping it's just a lot of love for how awesome Adam is. But I'm worried that he's hurt or something. Knowing that he's up at the bridge and busy jumping off stuff. So just being a concerned, Barry taught him how to skydive so he's kind of like my kid or brother kind of lady. Adam, like Chris, was one of Barry's kids. Our nickname for folks who learned how to skydive under Barry's supervision. Adam learned how to skydive in eight days. That was a miracle because most, mostly because of how finicky the Illinois weather can be in the summer. It's very rare to get eight jumpable days in a row between thunderstorms, potential tornado activity, and high winds. But Adam had the perfect window and earned his license in just eight days. When we moved from Chicago to Southern California in late 2011, Adam wasn't far behind. He came to visit and then eventually he moved to California as well. He lived with us for a bit in 2012 and was Jezebel's favorite new human in the house. That morning, like the moments after Barry told me that Chris had killed himself, everything was moving in slow motion. Our friends Tom and Tracy, two of my competitive mentors, had recently moved to Southern California. They were also from the drop zone in Illinois, and we had a nice little contingent of Chicago skydivers slowly infiltrating this drop zone. They were at the skydiving center that morning, and I sat outside and chatted with Tom for a bit, venting my frustrations with not being able to train and talking about how much I missed doing team jumps since my teammate was injured. I went back into my office to check my email and post to Facebook to get more people to come out and jump over the weekend when my phone rang. It was Eric. Is Adam okay? I asked, praying it was a yes, but feeling deep in my soul it was a no. <clears throat> I don't remember exactly what Eric said, but I ran out of the office wailing. Adam was dead. Later conversations would reveal that he had been helping with first jump courses and that and he said he would be as he said he would be in his earlier messages to me. They decided to jump somewhere that Adam hadn't jumped before, a cliff. He had been doing bridge jumps with no problems, but on this particular jump, his canopy opened off heading, turning him away from his desired flight path and toward the cliff. He struck the cliff he jumped off of, falling some 200 feet after the initial impact. One of the people he was jumping with administered CPR while they waited for the medics. He died before the medics could save him. Everything else was a blur and my memory of what happened next is spotty, but I remember running out of the office, grabbing Barry, as well as Tom and Tracy. I don't remember if I was able to get them into a team room to break the news or if I just told them right in there, right then and there. But all I knew was Adam was dead and these people needed to know. I tried to work that day. I tried to do anything other than cry. Eventually, my coach Wade has made, the, made his way to the drop zone. He asked what happened and Barry told him. Well, that's a choice he made to jump off a cliff, he said callously. Shortly after speaking with Barry, my coach found me to let me know that my teammate made a full recovery and the team wanted to resume training and go to nationals. No acknowledgement of the fact that someone who I considered a little brother had just died. No consideration for my feelings. Just an insult about base jumping to my husband. And then the only thing he said to me was letting me know that my team wanted to go to nationals after all. I took the rest of the day off, went to the liquor store and got all the supplies for our community that was grieving. Tons and tons of beer. I was waiting to hear about memorial services and I needed to figure out how we were gonna get to Illinois. I looked at my bank account. I only had enough money to get us to nationals or Adam's funeral. Both would be happening in Illinois and we couldn't afford to take two trips. I had a choice to make and after skipping the memorials for Chris and my uncle, I knew what I was going to do. When we got home from Adam's funeral in Illinois, it was time to jump into preparations for the biggest event of the year at the drop zone. The timing was perfect actually, because this was one thing I could throw myself into and did I ever. As the event neared, I pulled all the tricks out of my marketing hat and made sure this was the biggest, best, most well-attended event that drop zone had ever seen. And it was. A few days later, I woke up to a text message from a friend. It was a screenshot of a Facebook comment accusing my coach of raping a 14-year-old girl. I lost it. I wanted to throw up. I went straight into the detective mode and hopped on the county court website to see if I could find the arrest records. Still lying in bed, scrolling through arrest records on my phone, I found it. My stomach sank to my toes as I read the words on the screen. Six felony charges. As I read, my vision started crossing and I felt like I was going to throw up. Preventing the victim from reporting. Unlawful sex with a minor. Lewd and lascivious acts with a minor under 14 with force. Oral copulation with a person under 16. Penetration with a person under 18. I passed my phone to Barry. Things started to make sense. Between the comments about Chris and Adam, the flip-flopping on whether or not we were going to nationals, and my choice to go to Adam's funeral over competing with my team, my relationship with my coach had been deteriorating and we were barely speaking to each other. He was short with me and I just wanted to do my job. 
I took a break from jumping when Adam died and he wasn't happy about it. When I started working for him, he clearly stated that he wanted me to be jumping all the time with as many people as possible. He was upset with me for not jumping during this period of time, as if my grief, grief were an inconvenience to his personal and professional life. As a result, I was questioning how long it was taking me to grieve. Should I be ready to jump by now? Was I overreacting? He hadn't been on the drop zone since the big event, and now it made sense. He was arrested a few days after the event ended and was laying low. Barry and I decided to say nothing and see how it played out. Within a few days, word started to get out. Other people saw the Facebook comments and did their own digging. Barry and I were at an event in San Diego when we got a call from an instructor asking what we knew. We told him what we found, and the arrest records indicated that he had a court date coming up. The next day, we went back to the drop zone, and I spoke with his business partner. At the time, I was the director of events, marketing, and public relations for this business, and a fully sponsored competitive skydiver. With one of the owners being arrested on six felony counts of various degrees of sexual assault with a minor, I did not want this to be my responsibility to clean up if it blew back on the business. If this was true, and I had a feeling it was, I could not continue to do my job, generating revenue for this business and lining the pockets of a sexual predator. This was not how my legacy in the sport was going to play out. My coach's business partner defended him in that meeting. He said the victim was making it up and that she was starved for attention. After the meeting, my coach walked around telling everyone that we shouldn't worry. What happened was consensual. These stories weren't lining up and I knew this was going to get messy. I turned in my resignation that day. I gave them until the end of the year and I said I'd help and find and train my replacement. I offered to write out a manual for whoever stepped in to replace me. The work I did affected every area of the business, new tandem students, skydiving students going through the training program, keeping the student engaged and in the community after graduation and making this drop zone the best place in the world for people to jump out of planes. My job was multifaceted and when done correctly, it was a major revenue driver for the business. My last skydive was on my last day of work, December 29th, 2014. So that's chapter one. Woo! <laughs> that's a big one. So while I've been reading these last two days, um, Catherine Osborne, who designed the coloring page for this book, shown right here, has been doing some of her lettering. So yesterday she wrote, welcome to the campfire. The mantra for today's campfire is I am a survivor. Um, and all of that was pretty heavy, but it's all stuff that I survived. So if this is your first time joining us, something that I want um, to encourage you to do is as I read over the course of the next 19, 18 days now, and as you go through this book, as we have these conversations, make notes on the things that trigger you. What are you feeling? Where do you feel it in your body? Have you felt this before? And if so, what made you feel it then? Because when we start to connect the dots on what are the things that are triggering us and where do we feel it in our body, we can start to reconnect between the connection between our mind and body and start to understand the things that trigger us. So if there's parts of my story that make you feel anxious or triggered or any kind of way, make a note about that because as you do and over the course of this event, we'll be able to start to connect the dots on your story and see what's happening in your life and what you're carrying in your trauma pack. So Catherine's still drawing. She's going to keep going with that. But while we um, get ready, I'm just going to share a little thing here. So if you are on um, the YouTube stream, I just want to share a little bit with you here. Oh, geez. Let's see. Let's go bigger. Yeah. All right. So. Do, do, do. Yeah, we'll do that. So our first guest is going to be Miss Linda Rubin. Linda, if you want to pop on your video and unmute yourself, Linda is Adam's mom. And I am so excited to have her here today, mostly because every time I talk to her, I find some kind of epic something that I didn't know before, whether that's about Adam or about myself or about grieving. So Linda, welcome. It's so nice to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Sydney. Um, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I appreciate it. And um, I'm excited to uh, be here for the 20 days just just to uh, observe and, and keep in touch. Yeah, it's nice to have you. So where are you? Uh, you're in Illinois. Tell us a little bit about you, where you're from, um, 
what you're doing here? Like, why are you here? Other than that, the fact what that are you I doing here? You, like, why is Linda Rubin <laughs> on this planet? <clears throat> Um, I, I'm in Chicago, Illinois. I am in a, uh, the northwest suburbs of Chicago, Illinois. I uh, grew up in the city of Chicago. I moved to the suburban area um, when I got married and was planning on having uh, kids and, and the whole white picket fence idea, you know, uh, marriage, building a house, um, excuse me, building house and, uh, and, and moving on from there. So we, we, we picked an area where the school districts were great. And, uh, I have not gone back to the city, um, since, um, I've, uh, become a suburbanite out here and, um, I can see my lovely daughter is here tonight and, and she was born and raised hey. in the suburbs, not the city. Um, yet she moved out to the city uh, a few years back and, and she loves it. She loves it. Um, why I'm here. Um, you know, if you would have asked me that question, um, you know, maybe 10, 11 years ago, um, that answer would have been different than what it is today. Um, today, um, I know I have a purpose in life and, um, it constantly involve, evolves and change. Um, I know, um, simply said, you know, I, I believe my purpose is, um, to be an active participant, uh, in life and help other people. Uh, I do know that that's my purpose. I when I say I wouldn't I, I didn't I wouldn't have had that answer um, 10 11 years uh, you know some years back yeah. and you asked me I think I would have answered with that with what I was living at the time like what what my roles were in life you know whether that be, um, a daughter, uh, a wife, a mom, um, uh, the jobs I did have, um, I would have, of, of, or I know I did, I mistaken my purpose for the roles that I was playing in life. <clears throat> and I would say to fast forward that and how that changed is um, a running into myself, if you will, in, in life. And, um, and when things started to fall apart around me, I started to lose self. And I realized that myself and my worth, what I, what I defined myself and worth was based on the roles I played in life. And I didn't know that I was doing that um, until, um, you know, for me, you know, my experience, my experience is, um, my experience, strength and hope, um, uh, anything I ever share, um, uh, whether it's uh, one on one or a group of people, um, I often say I have many truths. I do believe the truth never changes. And, um, I'm still discovering my truths, you know, I'm still incorrect, um, with what some of those, uh, truths are and, um, they are exposed to me. Um, and so when I say I share my experience, strength and hope, you know, um, if I have opinions, you know, my opinions are not based on truth. They're based on, on, on my life and what I've lived. And I may experience some things that other people experience yet. I believe that our own, as, as, you know, Sydney has talked about it, you know, our own journey and where we, where we come to meet ourselves at different times, um, changes. And, um, for me, <clears throat> part of my story, my life is 12 years ago. When I started to experience 
hardships in life. Um, I think there's a song that, that has a, um, a, uh, a lyric on it where it says, you know, um, I drowned my sours, sorrows in, in, you know, a bottle and, um, until my sorrows learned how to swim, you know, and so I did not know how to show up for myself. I didn't know how to, I didn't know how to cope. I didn't know how to live life on life terms. And so, um, I am a recovering, uh, alcoholic addict. What that means for me and, 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 it, 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 and if I can relate it to what you're doing today, um, Sydney in life is, um, through a vessel and through a path, I was led to a spiritual way of life, you know, um, you know, some people, um, you know, as you, you know, you, the healing power of nature, you know, and that's, that's where you have, have come to know your true self and, and constantly being exposed. And for me, it was this path, um, which, which I've been living on, um, you know, for the past 12 years. And I am truly, truly grateful for that. Um, I can be present for myself. I get, you know, I, I am <laughs> one of my favorite, my favorite statements and lines is that, um, you know, I'm male adjusted to life. You know, I don't, <laughs> you know, and that's just coping with daily stresses, <laughs> you know, not, not the big stuff, you know, right. um, I mean, in, 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 in spite of the big stuff. And, um, so today that is my purpose. My, my purpose is, is to continue to live a, a, a life of a spiritual path and, uh, continue to show, help others, you know, uh, on that path or in their life, you know, so. I love that. Thank you. I'm so glad that you're here. Um, I was saying earlier that every time we talk, I come away with some new understanding or myself or a new memory about Adam that I didn't know or one that I forgot that, that gets triggered by our conversations. It's always just really good stuff. So um, I know today we're going to be talking about grief and silver linings and what it means to live your dash. Where do you want to start? Because we've got about... 20, 22 minutes to just kind of riff. And I'd love to just let you kind of take the wheel here. But I mean, if, if you want to talk about like the day that you found out about Adam and what your life has been like since then, I feel like that could be a really powerful conversation for anybody that's lost somebody, especially for anybody that's watching that's lost a child. Cause that's one of those things that we don't anticipate. Um, I'm not a mother, so I, I won't ever experience that, but that's not something you anticipate when you have kids. Like you don't imagine that you will outlive your children. So um, do we want to just start there and then kind of see where this goes? Cause I. So nice sure. Sure. Live your dash. Yeah. And yeah. When you, and, 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 you, and, 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 and as you, and as you were just wrapping up what you were just saying in, 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 in what you were saying there, <clears throat> all of a sudden my, 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 my belly did a flip flop in there, you know? And, um, uh, let me, here, I'll start with this. Let me, um, the, the relationship with my children, um, Nicole, um, which is, uh, here with us this evening and Adam, um, Adam, um, is my oldest. Um, they were born two years and nine months apart. Um, I believe I had come to a point in life where my kids knew who mom was. And, uh, and as I mentioned, you know, uh, along my journey, um, through life, um, it was very important to me. Um, I always treated both of my kids, um, with respect as human beings, you know, they, 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 they are people, you know, they, they weren't just, you know, my kids. Um, and so, 
I respected them as kids. I respected their life. I respected everything that, you know, they were experiencing in life at the time they were experiencing it, whether they were two years old or 20 years old. Um, with that being said, you know, um, both of my children got to know who mom was. And when I started to discover who Linda was, you know, not, not just mom, you know, I, I, I didn't know that it started happening, but both of my children got to know who Linda was. You know, they knew who her mom was, but they knew who her Linda. And I pride myself on having um, a very stable, open relationship with both of my children, you know, through communication. Um, and I love that. You know, I love that. So with that being said, um, <clears throat> as you mentioned, Adam had moved to California you know, with you. And so <clears throat> fast forward um, with his skydiving journey in his life, he was the happiest that he ever had been on that line of he had found himself there, you know, in the nature, mm -hmm. in the skydiving. And um, you mentioned you didn't have kids, but, you know, you relate to, um, you know, hiking my feelings as the closest you're going to come to birthing something you know yeah. and um and there's truth to that and so when i say this i believe you'll understand what what i mean and and others also you know with that have this uh relationship with that is that <clears throat> the relationship that i had have with my children has always been this uncon unconditional life love and and people may you know, ponder on that, what is unconditional love? And what I will tell you is, for a period of time, I would have told you what a wife was, I would have told you what a mom was, a friend was. Today, I cannot define any of those things. You know, so same thing with the unconditional love. You know, um, I might have had a, 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 de a, a, a defining uh, idea of what unconditional love meant and I would have been wrong and I would have sold myself short you know I know these things today because I experience them I feel them I can't I can't define them and um, and and they're limitless and so with that being said that unconditional love and, and the feeling that I get for with an unconditional love with something you know going back and forth is that when you have this <clears throat> person or thing or or something that you have created um when they experience joy the joy that you experience from that joy that's being experienced is just <clears throat> unlike any anything you know so <clears throat> when adam had discovered this part of him and 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 he just bloomed he just bloomed um, I mean, he was, he was there, he knew himself, he was connected. It, it, it literally had changed the person he was 360 degrees. So with his skydiving, it was something that he did, um, not part-time. Uh, it was his love. He thoroughly enjoyed it. There was no doubt about that. You know, um, living the dash, living the dash is a poem that I, I, I have, have loved for a long, long time. And um, I remember um, when I went, a friend of mine made me a shadow box with the poem and uh, and did some pretty artwork in it. And, um, and I remember when Adam uh, had visited from California, which he was, he would always, um, you know, come and visit. Um, and I remember when he came and I wanted to show him my shadow box. And it was the first time ever, I think I, I said, I don't know if I shared my 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 poem, the, my favorite poem with you. And so I started to, I said, so I grabbed it and I said, look, and I started to read it to him. And then a couple lines into it, you know, he knew me, but it, it started to swell up in me, right? The feel of it. He's like, here, give it to me. I'll read it because it's going to go faster than if you read it. <laughs> <clears throat> and uh, he adopted that as his uh, favorite poem. And it's been my favorite poem because, you know, it talks about someone passing. But the meaning that it has to me is 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 the thing that um, applies to every one of us. When I talk about showing up for ourselves, and if you will um, bear with me, I am going to read it. Um, Yay! I was hoping you would. I had it pulled up just in case you didn't. <laughs> thank you. 
It's called The Dash, and it's by Linda Ellis. I read of a man who stood to speak at a funeral of a friend. He referred to the dates on the tombstone from the beginning to the end. He noted that the first came the date of birth and spoke of the following date with tears. But he said what mattered most was all, was, was all, what mattered most of all was the dash between those years. For that dash represents all the time they spent alive on earth and now only those who love them know them what that little line is worth. For it matters not how much we own, the cars, the house, the cash. What matters most is how we live and love and how we spend our dash. To think about this long and hard, are there things you'd change, you'd like to change? For you never know how much time is left that can still be rearranged. To be less quick to anger, to show appreciation for and love the people in our lives like we never loved before. If we treat each other with respect and more often wear a smile, remembering that this special dash might only last a little while. So when your eulogy is being read, with your life's actions to rehash, would you be proud of the things they say about how you live your dash? And that's mm. my favorite poem because that line in there where it talks like, what would you like to rearrange? You know, um, we may... I think um, our birth date is important. It's unique. Other people share it, but it's when we came into this earth, there is only one of us. And then, you know, the day we, 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 we pass. Um, and so that little dash is not so little. And, and if life is going in a direction that you're not happy with and you're, and you're lost and you don't know where to turn, life isn't over. You know, life is not over and we could rearrange and, and, and in the, in the, um, within this epidemic and being isolated, you know, all of, I mean, look at how we are all connecting. And I think there's a, um, for most, I would hope from, you know, is that we're, we're seeing a new, we're, we're, we're I don't know that seeing, we're feeling a, a new gratitude you know, of people and connections and that love, you know. So again, this is where that dash applies to me. Um, my son's life, 23 years of age. Um, I will say we had conversations about, you know, should something like this happen? And, um, you know, um, I was his biggest fan. In my mind, he was going to live on forever. Um, well, not forever, you know, good life. And, um, and, um, he did live a good life better, you know, better. I mean, one <laughs> of his favorite sayings was you only live once, okay. but if you do it right, once is enough. And, um, I don't even know, think he knew. I mean, that, that original quote is from Mae West. I don't even think he knew who Mae West was, but, you know, but, um, he loved that and he lived that and I was his biggest fan I wouldn't change anything except for that obvious but I'm still his biggest fan you know what he found in skydiving in life it brought him to his spiritual self and you can't take that away from somebody you know um, and so um, on the day I'll, I'll, you know, on the day that I heard, it was a phone call, and um, I'll put it in, in words as um, my partner and my love and my support, um, his name is Forrest, he said, I never seen somebody looking at them, he says, and in one moment, he saw, he said, I literally, 
you you hear about a person falling into pe a thousand pieces. He said, I literally saw it. He says, and I, 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 and, um, and so I can go on talking about this forever. But what I will say is for those experiencing something of, of that great loss, you know, great, great. And here's the other thing, you know, a lot of people, um, they want to be able to share like your loved ones around or your friends. And, and so with a lot of people try to, um, you know, they think of the worst thing that has happened in their life and they'll go on to tell you about that. And because that's, the, it's an uncomfortable thing in grief for people that, that love you and, and for the person sitting in it. And for the first couple of years, I, I believe I was, uh, you know, uh, by a higher power universe, God, whatever you want to call it, a power greater than myself, put me in a spiritual shock. So I will say for the first 12, uh, 24 months, 24 and a half months, um, I didn't know, I didn't have, I, I was disconnected. I had no idea. Um, but what I will say is because I was on the spiritual path, you know, um, I leaned into it. I didn't turn away from it. I leaned into it and I leaned it. You know, I call the hashtag fa family group, you know, it, it, it's a fellowship among all of you. And, and, and I have that in my life. And I, and, and I fell on the support of the fellowship because I didn't even know how to ask for help or what help to ask for, you know, when I was carried. Um, and, 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 um, it's been five years and, you know, it's, it's a, obviously a sore spot with me, you know, and when people, oh, how long has it been? I'll say five years and they're like, oh, you know, like in other words, it didn't happen yesterday. So I'm okay. Like you should be over it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, yeah. And that, and that's the thing, you know, uh, since you mentioned that Cindy, um, you know, there, there is no getting over it. With anything of, of of major trauma in life, and that's that's the key word, the trauma. You know, with whatever traumas we go through in life, we don't we don't get over it. I don't I don't think anyone gets over it. You know, we go through it. You know, and 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 yeah. and we're able to go through it with support. You know, um, not locking people out, not turning away. Um, and, and having the people around you that love you, you know, because it can be difficult for the people around you watching you go through this, you know, and a lot of things that are said or a lot of things that maybe people do, yeah. they're uncomfortable with it and they don't know what to do for you. And so they, they, they want to help you in a way, you know, and, and. And I think the best thing is um, there's no words spoken to anybody going through that that's going to help. I think the best thing is a really, really, really nice tight hug and no words. And um, yeah, I've grown and I've healed through this. And, um, and I've been able to do that. Um, again, because of the connection that I have with spiritual self and those around me. Um, I didn't want to go on living. You know, um, it was like this, this grateful heart that I had that I woke up with every day and the zest that I had for life, um, which I, I, I knew I had it. And so I don't want to say I took it for granted, but sometimes you can't help to take, like when that was snuffed out, I was afraid. I was afraid I wouldn't get the zest for life back. I was afraid that the light would not be lit again. I was afraid. I was afraid to go on living. I didn't want to die, but I didn't want to go on living. You know, um, and back to the dash, you know, I, I, Jeez, you know, I, I love that poem. And I'll tell you, I, you know what, with any of my kids, I brag all the time, you know? And so, you know, I carry my son with me here, but I carry his prayer card 
with me in my back pocket all the time. And I carried the dash. And so when somebody asked me, you know, about my son, I'm like, oh, let me share. Or my daughter. My daughter, I got, you know, pictures on my yeah. phone and I share. And then when I share that, I share the dash with them. And these I have, I order about 50 of them all the time. Because when someone's not familiar with it, or they are, or they have it, and they're like, oh, my God, I love that, I give them the card, you know, said so it's yours to keep. Um, it reminds me. Oh, and then, yeah, can't see that, but Sydney, Sydney <laughs> did a picture of it, and, you know, we got, you know, Live the Dash right on our, our tattooed on our arms when we out in California, and my daughter, and uh, it's there to remind me. It's there to remind me because anytime I'm at my, 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 my lowest or my heart and I just want to lay down on my head and cry, who do, we go like this, right? And I see live your dash and I'm reminded on a daily basis. And so we don't overcome on a daily basis and I don't think it'll ever end. I come to terms with it, you know, and, and we overcome. And, you know, I'm a believer that, um, you know, there's a saying that, you know, we won't be given any more than we can handle. I believe we'll be helped with what we are given, you know, and we have to turn into that, 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 that's bigger than us for that help with, with whatever that be. And, um, you know, Sydney, that, you know, we, you, you, in, in your read in this chapter, and I'm telling you every time I get to that part, you know, I got to just put it down for a minute because I can't see through crying every time I read it. And, and then I pick it back up and, and yeah. you'll touch back on it, uh, to, you'll touch a little bit on it tomorrow night in the next chapter, but you go on to talk about the last event you had. And I'm going to tell you how other people, and we don't know the impact that they have in our lives. And and Sydney's last event was the memorial day for my son, Adam. And I don't remember word for word, Sydney, but I remember we were having a conversation some time back. And I don't know if it was before hiking my feelings, but um, you said something along the lines about you know, the, the, the events you have done and, you know, and, and along the line, and I'm paraphrasing along the lines of how, you know, if you helped anybody or, or if it did anything for anybody, you know, how, how you know, um, because we're fulfilled right through our purpose. And sometimes when we don't know if we, we, you know, made a difference, and I think it was along that. At least that's what I remember. And I remember telling you, Sydney, you know, the event that you put on, you know, for Adam's Memorial, for all you know, and because I know where where I was at that time, is that event saved my life. That event saved my life. Um, I choose to... I'm his mom, so I celebrate his life every day. But when other people celebrate his life and, and share with me how Adam has touched their life, I still get that, that joy that comes from other people, that, that joy that I talked about, that unconditional love. There's like this automatic connection. And, um, I'll end with this, you know, our egos, which are very big, they rebuild all the time, you know, and, 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 uh, I run into mine all the time, you know, and, and I got it, you know, and our ego says, uh, and my ego, um, <clears throat> Is, uh, you know, um, that I think I can control things, that I think I have, you know, uh, I got everything under control and, 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 and all this other stuff, you know. And so, ego says, once everything falls into place, you will find peace. Spirit says, 
find peace and everything will fall into place. Uh, I love that. Do what you love, love what you do, and live your dash. I thank you for letting me share. Thank you for being here. Oh my goodness. I like, I wish we had all the hours of all the days um, to talk, but in the spirit of what you were just talking about with Adam and his like things that things when people share stories about him that and how that brings you joy and how that helps kind of keep his memory alive. Um, I do have a surprise for you. And before this talk, um, I had asked you if I could see some pictures um, of Adam that I could use. And if you go to hikingmyfeelings.org slash Adam, um, Hiking My Feelings has started a Adam Rubin Trail Angel Memorial Fund, which those donations, when people donate to this fund specifically, um, will be held in a separate little like kitty, as it were, um, to support people who want to go on these long through hikes across the country and around the world. Um, one of the things that I learned about Adam after he died was that he wanted to hike the Appalachian Trail. He was the one that introduced me to through hiking. He was the one that told me that you can go hike from Canada to Mexico or Mexico to Canada on the Pacific Crest Trail. I didn't realize that the Appalachian Trail was the one that he wanted to do, but it is because of Adam that long distance hiking was a seed that was planted in my brain. So my intent with this fund is to offer scholarship programming for new hikers. So we have a program that we're launching in June called Blaze Your Own Trail to Self Love. I'll be talking more about that on my birthday, but in essence, it's a 12 week program um, online and in person as we can start to gather again. But the component that is really interesting to me about that particular program is the hiking training progression. So if you've never been on a hike before, um, but you want to start and you're not sure how that's part of this program. So um, the fund will offer scholarship spots for people who can't afford to take our program but are interested in the material itself and we'll also set aside money to sponsor through hikers that are ready to go do this trail but they just need a little bit of money um, to help make it happen so we'll be opening applications for that once we have the fund funded but this is the first day that it's open so anybody that's watching that's um, moved by adam moved by adam's mom moved by the conversations that we're having here um, anybody that wants to offer up resources to help um, bring more people out on the trail so they can have these experiences in nature where they can find healing. Um, go to hikingmyfeelings.org slash Adam and you can learn more about the fund. And as we have more information to share about that, we will absolutely bring you in Linda and let you know. Um, but I just wanted to let you know that that is something that we've started. It starts today. Um, and that's just one way that we can keep Adam's memory alive and keep um, sharing his story. So thank you for being here with us today. Thank you for sharing um, about your experiences after Adam's passing. And I love you so, so much. And I'm just so thankful that you are still here and that you did keep living because my life is monumentally better with you in it. So thank you. Thank you, Sydney. God, I love seeing his face. I know. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. It never gets old. I love you. <laughs> I it love you, it. Cindy. Thank so you. For anybody that, and for, yes, I did want to say for this. That doesn't know. This Chicago thing, thing was, or no, it was the 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 PC the Pacific Trail thing that I was going to go on that COVID canceled. That was going to be my first hike ever. Yeah, it'll happen. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, wow. it'll happen. So thank you. I love you very much. I love you, Sydney and Barry. Oh, I will tell him. <laughs> All right. So up next, we have um, Sensi Trails. They are a local band here in Southern California. They um, recently had my favorite song that they sing is called Just Living. I'm hoping, hint, hint, that that's on the set list. Um, but this song in particular um they wrote and their music video for it just hit a million views over the holiday weekend so first of all congratulations guys um and if you just want to do a quick introduction say hey who you are and um what you're up to and if any of you while you're introducing yourselves have a connection to nature that you want to share about let's talk a little bit about that and then you can just jump right in and, and play some music for us Ooh. yeah uh 
Thanks, Sydney. Yeah, we're Cincy Trails. Uh, we're from here in San Diego. And uh, I was telling them earlier when we first got here to the Reggae Ranch, like getting out of the city for a while felt really good. And just like even after a few moments of being out of the car, just being here and like the serene views of the mountains and everything is it actually made me feel different. So I liked it a lot and uh, we're really excited to be here. Awesome. First song is called Purpose. Do we have time for more than one? Your purpose, we're all searching to put the meaning of this life. What is your purpose? We're all searching to put the meaning of this life. Purpose, we're all searching, okay, to put the meaning of this life. What is your purpose? We're all searching to put the meaning of this life. Wake up. Open your eyes, you've got to realize you have a purpose in this life. Choose the path you want to walk, but don't do it blindly. This life is very short, so use your time wisely. All of us were born to teach and inspire. Sharing the truth with the masses before we expire. We're spreading peace, love, and unity to everyone we meet. The fire's burning hot now, can you feel the heat? Traveling across the land, across the seven seas. So when we die, we leave behind our legacy. What is your purpose? We're all searching. Did you put the meaning of this life? What is your purpose? We're all searching. For the meaning of this life. Whoa, whoa. Purpose, we're all searching, okay, to so put the meaning of this life. What is your purpose? We're all searching, to so put the meaning of this life. So purpose, we are searching, now it's time to realize that you create your path in a place better open up your eyes. Pollution and confusion, or upon the mind. But that's what will I ever let it conquer that we must rise, I say, fight to find the meaning, your destiny will be Suppress it, not no thinking, tell me I cannot be right Awake on your soul, let your fight your bird right Because we are like searching for a purpose in this here life What is your purpose for all searching? So to put the meaning of this life What is your purpose for all searching? So to put the meaning of this life like whoa, whoa. Purpose, we're all searching, okay, to so put the meaning of this life. What is your purpose? We're all searching, to so put the meaning of this life. Your purpose for all searching to put the meaning of this life. What is your purpose for all searching to put the meaning of this life? Like, whoa, whoa. purpose for all searching okay. to put the meaning of this life. What is your purpose for all searching to put the meaning of this life? Yeah. Thank you so much. This next song is called Caving In. Well, no, I want to let you know oh, my love. Everything is caving in, you gotta look up And keep your spirit 
was lifted like the clouds up above. And use your heart for its purpose to find love. And then you know what I'm thinking of. Cause you got those smiles that I'm craving. Your smile so amazing. I'm lost and I can't find my way. Got my body shaking, my heart racing. You give me life, but take my breath away. Yes, I know that you're all mine. And my girl, I still need you to know. You lift me up when I'm feeling low. So low, oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, no. I wonder that you know oh, my love When everything is caving in I'm going your way It's going away It's going away You gotta look up, look up And see the brighter side of today And use your mind for its purpose To think of what to say to someone to put a smile on their face Cause you got those eyes that I'm craving Your smile so amazing got me lost and I can't find my way Got my body shaking, my heart racing You give me life but take my breath away Yes, I know that you're all mine Girl, I still need you to know Lift me up when I'm feeling low So low, oh, yeah, yeah, Oh, no I'm gonna let you know My love Shout out to Hike My Feelings Thanks for having us here at the virtual campfire Got those eyes that I'm craving, your smile so amazing. Got me lost and I can't find my way. Got my body shaking, my heart racing. You give me life, but take my breath away. And yes, I know that you're all mine. Girl, I still need you to know. Pick me up when I'm feeling low. So low, oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, guys. So that song is called Just Living. I give things for this life that we're living Cause it could be gone in an instant Days go by with the blink of an eye So don't take anything for granted and I really wanna know where we go when we die But I don't wanna keep asking Cause I know the day you'll come around When I'm no longer alive But for now we're just living Now we're just living Oh, taking it day by day, don't really know what I'm doing. And no, oh, I know where I want to be, so I'm going to keep on pushing. Pushing to the victory. Paying my dues and I'm learning my lessons. This life such a blessing, baby. This life such a blessing, yeah. This life such a blessing. We've been out here for a long time, so we make the most of every day in this life. Sometimes the world be getting me down, but I know I'll be alright with my friends at the reggae ranch around. Stay close to the ones you love. Could be the last time that you see them. Because tomorrow is not guaranteed, but for right now we're just living. I get things for this life that we're living, cause it could be gone in an instant. 
The days go by with the blink of an eye, so you don't take anything for granted. I really want to know when we go when we die, but I don't want to keep asking. Cause I know the day you come about when I'm no longer alive, but for now we're just living, for now we're just living. Oh, taking it day by day, don't really know what I'm doing, nobody does. excited thank you guys so much for being here i love it you guys are awesome so real quick if you guys enjoyed that performance um as you know everybody that has ever been on tour ever or who relies on touring for income to buy groceries to pay bills to put a roof over their head uh they don't have that touring income so up on the screen right now is our virtual tip jar for sensi trails you can find them on venmo at sensi trails paypal sensi trails at gmail.com cash app sensi trails Guys, thanks for being here. We love you. So much love. So, all right then. Up next, <laughs> oh my God. I don't know if you guys are ready for this. So my girl, Christine Sherinian is here. She uh, attempted the PC or the PCT, the Trans Catalina Trail in one day, which is just mind blowing. And uh, she's gonna tell us a little bit about her experience on the Trans Catalina Trail, doing it in one day. <laughs> How are you, Christine? I think you're still muted, so we probably ought to unmute you. Hi. <laughs> there she is. <laughs> hey, girl. So, hey. Yeah, yeah. PCT one day, no big deal. Casual PCT. I'm gonna do that next. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Most most people most people do it in months, but you know we'll just I mean, do it in one day. It's fine. She flies like a bird. It's great. A couple cliff, cliff bars, some water, easy peasy. Um, so, yeah. So, tell me, I want you to just, I, this is what we're going to do. I just want you to jump straight into the story of how you picked the Trans Catalina Trail, what your mindset was going into it. And like, did you actually intend to do it in one day? Or was it like you had a day and you were going to see as far as you could go? Just tell us the story and I'll interrupt you as I see fit. Sure. <laughs> Perfect. So first, you know, I'm in like full quarantine life right now. I'm, I moved from New Jersey. I, I live in New Jersey. I moved over to the beach area where my cousins have a house. This way I can like be by water and like 
I miss the sunset that wasn't like blocked by my building. This is great. So, you know, you know, feeling good. Um, yeah. This is less <laughs> tan than I was after I got off the um, TCT from the one day where I was severely sunburned after that, because, you know, it's a little sunshine for an Armenian girl. So, you know, anyway, so, so yes, I had planned on doing TCT in one day. I watched some YouTube videos. It looked like it was doable. I mean, this guy's GoPro showed him going pretty fast and he was able to do it in one day. So why couldn't I? Um, it was hatched because um, at the time, um, a, a, a boyfriend of mine and I had been talking about it and we planned to do this, this together. And we're like, let's do it in one day. We, we knew exactly what we needed to do. We kind of had a pace that we wanted to follow. And, and then, you know, what's the worst that could happen? You know, we had, we had planned to stay on the island for one night and then leave uh, the next day. So um, fast forward to about two months later um, and um, he and I broke up. But in true, like, pure glutton for punishment fashion, um, I needed to still do this with him. I didn't want to do it alone. I wanted to do it with him because that was like, this is my way of healing. This is how I do it. I face my whatever pain I'm in and I face it head on. And um, so that was the plan. So we, yeah. I, 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 flying out to California, I had changed around my entire visit, which was originally going to be spending like a week and a half with him into, you know, I have friends everywhere, which is fantastic. I get to see Sydney and Barry. I get to see some other friends. And then I have this, this, you know, hike happening. So um, we meet up about four in the morning or so, before, you know, we get to get to Long Beach, we get on the ferry, get over there and we start. I'm like, this is way harder than the Stairmaster I was doing to train for this right now. So <laughs> let's see how this goes because this is, you know, and you know, you talked about hot spots when you did your, your hike, you talked about the hot spots. I mean, it was immediate. And, oh wait, let me rewind. So Sydney and I talked about this before I did it <laughs> and she told me all this stuff and she was like, let me give you some tips and she's get this, you know, like the skin band-aid things. Like, okay, so as soon as you feel it, do it. I'm like, this is going to be fine. If I have a little blister, I'm going to put this on and I'm going to be golden. Okay, that's like a big kind of work, okay? Like, it's like, like a little bit. So we, you know, again, but we were prepared. We had Haribo gummy bears, trail snack of champions. Um, I had, you know, plenty of water. Again, we knew where, what we knew where we would break. We knew food we were going to eat. We knew we were going to get ice cream at the airport. These are the things running through my mind. Um, like, where am I going to get my food? Um, and I had shoes. I, I'd broken them in. I, you know, I was ready for it. I had this cute little tank top on because I was like, with my ex-boyfriend, I got to look good. i um, got to make him be sad that he's missing me, you know. <laughs> Fine. No big deal. So we... Um, we get to a few miles in and I'm, I'm, and it's, it's a super hot day too. Okay. Temperature change for that day. It was supposed to be like in the seventies. It was like ridiculously hot. I mean, I don't know. The sun. And it's like, is there anything less forgiving than a valley on, on the Catalina trail? Like, I, I mean, less and nothing. There's this one, that one valley. I'm like, literally I'm on the sun right now. Like this is, this is unreal, unreal. Like there's barely, I was like running into like shade that I could find just to be able to like cool off a little bit. I'm like dripping sweat. I don't look cute anymore. FYI, definitely don't look cute anymore. <laughs> so we, we keep going and it's, it's getting hard. And I am, we get to the, you know, the hill that Sydney told me was, oh no, hold on, sorry. We go back, we get to blackjack. Feels so good. I take my shoes off. I use this like tape that's like a miracle worker, but it seems all right. Um, I'm like, I wish we were just camping here right now. Like I was done. I was totally done at that point. But we're like, no, we got to keep going. We were way behind schedule. We knew it, but we were like, let's keep going. And, and you know, we'll, we'll figure it out. We didn't have a plan for like, what happens if we don't get to the end, you know? 
yeah, if we, we didn't, we didn't care if we went out to the very tip, but we were like, if we get to, you know, if we get to two harbors, we're, we're good. We can do that. We didn't really know. We didn't look up any, I'm a, oh, also I'm a huge planner. I'm an event and trade show manager, but like, this was like me flying by the seat of my pants. Like, we'll just see how it goes and maybe, you know, it'll be okay and whatever. But normally I would have looked and seen, is there transportation anywhere? What if we get lost? You know, everything. I didn't do any of that. And my, my ex-boyfriend is a, um, a, like an outdoor person. Like he was like assistant director of outdoor education at Colgate University. He's like a rock climbing guide ice climbing this so I'm like I'm in totally good hands I'm I'm okay you know and and, and I, I was in general but you know in the sense of planning no it sucks it sucks so not good so we I, I was the planner in the relationship so then we we get to um um we get to the bottom of this hill after we'd been hiking after our stop at blackjack and Sydney was like this is a piece of cake no big deal and I'm like like it's a little hill, but it's fine. I'm not, I'm walking up the hill. I'm like, what fucking cake is Sydney eating? I don't. I mean, what what is this? Like I, fruit cake? Like I don't really know. I'm thinking of the worst cake I could think of, and that's this hill. It's like not funfetti. It's probably that much. That right? cheesecake. It's like the worst cake you can think of. I don't know. It's like dirt cake, but probably that's tastier because like there's some protein in it with worms. I don't know. But like it was it was just awful. But I was crying, and you know, and and that was like you know how how are those little legs doing and we had made this joke ahead of time how like I, I'm sure I'm five foot two how like I don't know how fast my little legs are going to carry me across the trail you know like you get more you know miles from your step versus me so he's like how are those little legs doing and I'm like okay he's like how's that how's that brain doing and I'm like yeah, not good. Like my, my, at that point, my legs hurt. It was awful. I was cramping up really badly. We didn't have any bananas. Um, and I couldn't fix it with the potassium. So I was just, I was hard, but my brain was like, I have to finish this. Like it was as though if I failed doing the trail, it was like, I failed on a relationship. Right. It was like that combination of like, I have to succeed at something because this didn't work out between us. This has to work out for us. So as we we get, you know, we're getting closer to the airport. We get up there finally. And I mean, it's, if you've never done it, you're at the bottom, the airport's like, like here and it's like an oasis looking, right. You're kind of like looking up that to get to the airport. And it's like, ah, like, it's like a halo around it. It's, it's just, it looks great. I'm super excited to get there. There's ice cream there, cookies. Yes. So stoked. Like, um, yes, actually, hard stop. They yeah. have the best cookies in the world yeah. at that yeah. airport in the sky. Yeah. Like, if anybody here is considering doing the Trans Catalina Trail, if you saw me on tour last year, if you've read my book, what do I say we have to get between Blackjack and Little Harbor? The cookies. Yeah. Proceed. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's true. Like I'll do it again, like for the cookies, like everything else, you know, that's you know, for the right. cookies for sure. So, for snacks. you know, yeah. up, up until that point, like, you know, we had made like a turkey and an avocado sandwich, one single avocado we carried with us, um, one single avocado. And um, so we get to the airport and we look at what we have left. So we had a, about, we could have, it was like another, I think it's like another 10, that's 16.5 to the airport from when we started so I think it was like another seven to ten or something so like we could have stopped or whatever it is on the top of my head I, I don't remember but we looked at what at the time they had changed the trail around so it was a lot less flat and it was a lot steeper of a little bit up and down and it was getting darker um I we didn't neither uh, I had a headlamp with me but neither of us had anything Wait, no, I packed some cute pajamas in my, you know, thing and just in case we were staying in a hotel. But um I priority. This is like I was prepared for this hike, right, guys? Gummy bears, cute pajamas, one avocado. <laughs> That's all you need. One avocado. Be, yeah. <laughs> Disclaimer at the bottom of the screen, please like don't hike like her. Um, so so um we get, <laughs> I, I was like, we, we didn't have a plan that we had no camping, no, nothing. There's nothing that we can do 
at this point to like stop anywhere and sleep unless we got to the end where we had a hotel reservation at the airport there's no shuttles anymore they were done for the day like everything was closed we like barely got like anything we were at the airport and we're sitting there at the tables you know where it says like don't feed the foxes we're sitting at the picnic tables and I'm crying because I'm like this isn't gonna happen and 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 I'm just disappointed in the whole thing I'm bummed and I'm like pretty much like I'm hard on myself and but you know, this was tough. And then we're sitting there and we're talking and, and I'm like, what are we going to do? And I'm like, joking around. I'm like, well, we could text John and see if he'll fly over here and pick us up. This is my other ex-boyfriend who lives in California from New Jersey. Can't meet anyone out here. California's where it's at, guys. So um, I was like, we could text John and he could pick us up. And I'm like, do I want to do that? So I text him kind of as a joke and he knew we were doing this. John and I have been close friends he's amazing Sydney and Barry know him like he's a wonderful dude and he had known we were doing this and he had been teasing me about like doing it one day he goes I don't know how you <laughs> think those legs are going to do it I just don't know but um I'm like, John do you think you could pick us up at Catalina we'll pay the landing fee and thank god John just got his pilot's license a little while back so I had my boyfriend right before come pick me and my latest ex-boyfriend up from Catalina because we were done. Once I knew for sure that this was done and he agreed to pick us up, then I really lost my shit. And I was just, I was like, now it's over. Cause it was almost like when that hike ended, it was, we, me and Brett were totally done. Like this was our adventure together. And it was one of those like, well, we still have Catalina. We still have Catalina. And then once Catalina was done, it was like, I wanted it to end, but I totally didn't want it to end. So it's really like, it's a combination of, right. you know, relief that, okay, I'm getting picked up. I'm filthy. I'm looking forward to like, a not take it, you know, like walking anymore. My feet are done. I'm blistered everywhere. Uh, you know, like I, I couldn't even, I was nauseous. I couldn't even drink water. Like I was like forcing myself, you know, when you get to the point where you're forcing yourself to drink water because your body just doesn't want anything, you know? And, and it, I was relieved, right. but just brutally devastated that this was done. And now knowing that, like, what are we going to, what, what am I going to text him about? What am I going to talk to him about now? Like, we can't do this. And it was hard. And I, it was, uh, you know, but I felt great because I had just done 16 and a half miles in one day. It's a major accomplishment. And even though I didn't finish the, I didn't finish this, there was, there was, and Except, there for anybody that doesn't though. know, like that, just going from Avalon to Blackjack is like up and down five peaks, like, and then you went to the airport. Like, yeah. That is a huge, crazy day. Yeah. It was a long day. And we started a little later than we should have. And, you know, there's all sorts of factors, right? You know, you don't know what it's going to be like. You don't know the weather. You don't know how you're going to feel that day. Did you fuel properly the night before? Did you go to sleep at the right time? You know, and, and I got to say like mentally, I was all over the place. I was more worried about packing cute pajamas than like anything else, you know, like that, it, it just was one of those things. But that being said, success and failure is that like, I learned that, you know, yes, this, this didn't work, but I knew that you know, this was a person I had made some really awesome memories with, and we were able to do this together. And we had, I, I you know, it, like I was able to complete something. And even though it wasn't that tr the whole trail, I completed part of it. It's still completion, if you ask me. So, you know, um, it was, that was just kind of mm -hmm. one of my, you know, it was, a, it was the best, it was one of the best experiences I've ever had flashing most exhausting true story the next day because I really still hadn't eaten a lot the next day I was staying with a friend and it was about 12 o'clock she was wanting a glass of wine I'm like oh sure sounds great have a glass of wine now mind you when you hike 16 and a half miles in a day you probably you're using up a lot of your reserves right you're using up everything your body has you're it, it's totally done we have a glass of wine we go to in and out burger great you know like I'm the picture of health people seriously picture of health 
Um, we go to in and out Burger and we go, I'm like, okay, I'm standing there and I'm so now I'm getting super hungry. And I'm like standing there, standing there. We're waiting for her food. <laughs> no joke. I'm not, not even kidding you. I, you know, they have like the hot peppers like that are like waiting for you. Like you can, the chili peppers. So I take a, like a little thing of it and I eat one because I'm waiting. No less than five seconds later, I'm like seeing stars and I you know, just peeled over an in and out Burger because I could just pass out because I did nothing. I was done. I did a glass of wine in, in, in the 12 hours since the hike. And it was, again, like life lessons, like, okay, I've learned so much now about what your body needs and everything. No, I'm not even kidding you. This was my, this was my Terrence Catalina trail experience. It's, they won't, they won't sell my book in, in REI. They won't, they won't do it. Um, so they, they, they won't sign either. So it's fine. <laughs> But we'll start our own bookstore. Um, That's no, good. I, we'll they, do it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, nobody's coming to me for hiking advice, but um, but ultimately, it's just more about I'm I'm I am a forgiver of people. I want relationships with everyone. I've always wanted relationships with people I dated because I think memories are important, and I think that we should value the people that come into our life and why they come into our life for whatever reason it is. Um, you know, I, I look at that relationship and I looked at what it did for me at the time and some confidence it gave me, introduced me to some new things. Um, currently I'm working at a, um, I work for a private jet manufacturer doing their trade shows and events. So I'm working in aviation and my, that, that membret what is, is a charter pilot. So I was able to, you know, kind of see like the ropes of business aviation and understand it. And it kind of like piqued my interest. So it was like, I could, I like to go back and be like, well, this because of that, that because of this. And then that's how I got here. You know, like I met Sydney because the boyfriend that picked, the ex-boyfriend that picked us up was a skydiver and knew Sydney and Barry. So then I was kind of on the drop zone and I met Sydney, like in the bathroom at Skydive Elsinore. And it was amazing. And that's how I met. So like, I mean, what if I never dated that guy? Then maybe I wouldn't even met Sydney. Come world is that? So I appreciate all my relationships. Right. And this type of thing makes me, you know, the experience we had together, we'll always talk about it. Um, we always make, we can make jokes about it. I'm, you know, John still teases me about it to this day. Like when the memory comes up on Facebook or whatever. But it is, you know, it is one of those things. So, yeah, in a nutshell. I love it. I love it so much. And, like, <laughs> so, question. Yeah. If, if you had to do it again, would you bring more than one avocado or was one sufficient? <laughs> I would probably bring a banana with the avocado because yeah. um, they you complement need the each other well. From what I hear, yeah, it, I mean, really, the cramping, no joke. Like I, I, my, like I literally at one point like just fell to the ground, and I could, my leg like just gave out in, on me. You know what I mean? It was so bad. But it was, um, but no, I, I definitely would bring more than one avocado. I probably, I don't know if I would attempt it in one day again because I think I'd want to enjoy it a little bit more. I, I can, I would, I mean, if I want to be like a like a real rebel again about it, two days, you know. But I kind of would appreciate a longer, like a three, four day one, just to like really enjoy it. And I saw so many beautiful places. And that's probably why it took us so long because I kept stopping us saying, oh, I need to take pictures. I need to take that picture. I need to, you know, because it's just the most amazing place and the most amazing island that you, you don't want to, you don't want to rush it. It's a fine wine. You want to savor it. Or like a cookie where you don't want it to disappear. Yeah. You know, <laughs> also also that oh my gosh I love it so well let's <laughs> let's finish connecting the dots because we kind of yeah. did and then we didn't like we yeah. stopped so we met in the bathroom at the skydiving center because you were dating and that happened yeah. wasn't there yeah. something with my blog too like did you did he yeah. tell you like what was that yeah. whole thing because like there was like I had a fangirl moment about yeah. you and you were like yeah and I was like wait what <laughs> so like I had a fangirl moment about Sydney so I had seen he had, he had sent me Sydney's blog 
And at the time, the, the Sydney Unfiltered was, he had sent it to me and I like read it. I'm like, but I love this girl. She writes her life. She writes her feelings, like her guts are on the page. And like, that is like, I actually say this, I say this thing a lot where I say like, I use it all the time. Like, I love your guts. Like, hate guts is not fun. Like, I love your guts. It's like, you, man, you, like, guts are, like, in you. And you leave yours out on the page. And that was, like, so cool for me to see. So I remember I read Sydney before I met Sydney. And so I'm, like, most of, like, like a lot of the Hiking My Feelings family who has have read you and heard you before they've actually met you or if they didn't get to meet you on tour they are actually reading you before and they like see your guts before they see your face, which is crazy and amazing. Right. Like that's like, that's like such a beautiful thing. Right. If anyone doesn't think so, it, it's like, a, it's, you know, it's interesting to comprehend, you know, that you can know someone so well and not even know them in person yet. So that was, you know, that was huge for me to then when I went, well, Hold on. I first met Sydney in 2014 before I started skydiving. So before the bathroom, I like met her in passing while she was like in the midst of a giant event. And I think I'm like, I'm like, hey, Sydney, how are you? Nice to meet you. You know, like I'm so excited to say hi. And she's obviously busy. I mean, I know the way it works. Like, hi, how are you? Nice to meet you. Gotta go. You know, like everything's happening and I'm in charge. So this is my job. So gotta go. I'm like, okay. I'm like, oh, fuck, fuck, fuck. And like then, then fast forward like six months later, no, not even whatever. Now I'm there. Barry is, you know, in charge, and I'm so I got to be like be with Barry too, and and that is always, you know, it was it's always something so memorable to me. And then like I go in the bathroom, and I just finished my skydive, my first one, my first AFF jump, and I'm looking in the mirror, and I'm like super smiley. And I remember I'm wearing this shirt. This is Little Miss Giggles. I'm like, oh yeah, I just finished my first. AFF job, it was amazing. I looked at this, and Sydney was like, "Oh my god, I love you." And I'm like, "God, she finally loves me." <laughs> like total fan girl. It was awesome. It was, and then it, the rest is history. I love that. So then, after we met, you started dating this guy who flies planes, who does outdoorsy yeah. stuff. He was your adventure buddy. <laughs> then you yeah. tackle this island with nothing but bears and avocado bears, and, <laughs> and I love but I love the connection of like you probably had an easier time interviewing at the fa- at the, the falcon place uh, uh, <laughs> because you know that like you know the language you might not have worked in that industry before yeah because Crestron is definitely yeah. not private jets but yeah. you spent that much time in a relationship with a guy who does this that yeah. you now have this language and this understanding of the aviation industry more than your average cookie does. So yeah. I think it's really cool. And that's one of the things that we're really big about here at Hiking My Feelings is like reflecting back on these things. And I love what you were saying about honoring relationships. And yeah. even if they come in and out really fast, like everybody's here for a reason. And what is that purpose? And a lot of the times you don't see that until you look backwards. So sure. um, in the months after your Trans Catalina trail adventure, like what was that like emotionally for you with regards to the relationship and the purpose and all the things that you were doing? And when were you able to kind of look back and be like, oh, I get it. Like now, now I see why all of this stuff yeah. happened. Was there like a moment where you were like, oh, this is it? Yeah. And it, was, so it wasn't right away. It was brutal for like a few months afterwards, really hard. It was it was, you know, me chasing something that like I wanted, the thought I wanted. I was like, this has got to be better. It was just hard to, I couldn't figure it out. Um, and then I was like, well, I, t- and, you know, I told Sydney, I'm like, I want to write, just write something. And I wrote it just for me. It was just something that, you know, I wanted to write about like failure is success sometimes, basically. Like you don't, it doesn't matter if you fail, like you can always find something in there. And it took a few months. I think it's, it was like three months or so, at least three, four months that I sat on it. And I kind of, you know, toyed with it. I like looked through pictures as inspiration and try to help me heal from it from Catalina. And then it was, um, and then I, you know, I realized it, but you know, I will, I'm going to totally, like, do we have time? I'm going to totally blow your mind with a, everything happens for like, this is why, and this is it. Okay. 2010, 10 years ago, 10 years ago. 
I was laid off from my job at um, UBS Financial Services. I was doing marketing there. And I, um, I was devastated, you know, I was like, oh my God, I lost my job. What am I supposed to do with myself? And my dad at the time was saying to me, like, you, the best thing that'll ever happen to you, I promise. Okay, I'm unemployed for 11 months. Um, in that time, I actually got super healthy because I was very unhealthy. Um, I'd been carrying around a lot and I was, you know, then I had time to finally focus on me. So I, I worked out, I was changed, like eating my, reg, my eating regimen. It was great. One good thing. Then I get my job at Crestron, my old job. At that job, I meet John. Ex-boyfriend number one, John introduced me to the world of skydiving. Sky, I start skydiving. I meet Sydney. Okay, then through skydiving is how I met Brett because he was also a skydiver. So then I meet Brett, and then because of Brett, I start learning about business aviation and all of this kind of kind of stuff. Brett and I break up, but I get this job at Falcon. And I know all about it already. Like, had I not lost my job in 2010. I wouldn't be where I am today. I wouldn't know right? three, three whole people that are so important in my life. I would not even know them. Yeah. Well, and I think about that too. And especially when it comes to talking about trauma and reclaiming our stories and stuff like that. Like when I think back to my sexual assault, I say this over and over again. Like if I had to, if I had the opportunity to do it all over again, knowing what I know now, as much as I would hate to relive the worst moments of my life where my autonomy was taken from me, my body was violated, the most violent thing that can happen to the human body, short of being murdered alive um, or buried alive, is sexual assault. And if even knowing all of that and all the pain and everything I've been through, same thing, because if I didn't do that, or if I didn't, if I didn't do that, if that didn't happen to me, <laughs> then I wouldn't have made all the choices that I made, even though some yes. of them were so problematic, I wouldn't be here. Like I wouldn't have moved to Chicago. I wouldn't have been in the uh, uh, conference and gone skydiving out of the Chicago land plane in yes. Austin, Texas, only to return to Chicago to go get my license and like meet this dude who Barry yes. like was my skydiving instructor. That's how we met. But also he was the first person I told about my assault. And if I hadn't gone through all the things that I had gone through, I wouldn't be here by this fire wearing this t-shirt with this hair yeah. talking to you if I wasn't sexually assaulted. And so what does everybody who's ever been assaulted ever arrive at that place? I don't know that they do. I hope that people yeah. do. I hope that they can get to the point where they realize that even the worst things that happen to us make us who we are and that we always have a choice to choose love over fear. Yeah. I don't know if everybody will get there, but dang it, man, when you arrive at the place where you can look back and be like, yeah, there's been some shit, but I would do it all again. That is like one of the most beautiful places to be. And I don't think there's ever like, I don't think healing is a destination that you reach. I think it's a no. journey we'll be on for our entire lives. But man, if that's not like next level on the healing yeah. journey, when you can look back and just be like, yeah, I'd do that again, even if it was absolutely terrible. I so totally I agree. And I think if that. you pick, I agree. And I think that even if it's, so even if our lives are made up of small little traumas, right, that all happen, even if you take one small one, because maybe that big one is not, you're not going to be able to reach the, you're not going to ever be able to say, this is why. And that's, that, like you said, that might not ever happen, but maybe then pick a small, pick a small one and, and, you know, and search for the, the reason behind that. And it's not necessarily, sorry, it's not a reason because there's no like a written down, like right answer to it, but it's what can you pick right. from there that is good? It's, it's, it's just finding that speck of sparkle in like a really, really bad moment, you know? I love that. And I love you. Ah, oh, I'm so glad. I wish we had like all the time. I'm going to be like, and the next episode with Christine will be three hours long because we have so much catching up to do. <laughs> oh my God. Yes. We'll talk. Our next episode is about ramen. Um, and we will be discussing Fantastic. all the food that we ate. So I, <laughs> yes. And I would love to have you kick off the group gratitude circle. So for anybody that isn't aware 
the way we like to start closing things out here at the Hiking My Feelings virtual campfire, because this is night two, and if you haven't figured it out by now, you totally should. Everybody's like way behind. But we start with uh, this group gratitude circle where we share something that we're grateful for. So Christine, if you'd like to kick us off, I would love to know what you're grateful for. And if there's anybody that's in the Zoom meeting that wants to go, just put your video on and I will call on you to share what you're grateful for. That's how we're going to do it, because last night was a bit of a uh, musical chair. So Christine, what are you grateful for? Okay. Um, okay. Um, I, I thought there's so many things. Um, I'm not, you know what? There we go. I'm super grateful for having so many things to find and be grateful for. Um, I am able to, I'm grateful for most importantly though, in this time, especially during this time, which is hard, where we feel a little bit isolated, um, quarantine, depending on where you're quarantined, who you can quarantine with. Um, I am grateful, grateful, grateful for my friends, like, and family as well, but friends know you in a different way and, and friends of our family also know you in a different way. And they're, they're the people that keep you going in day 75, 90 million or whatever we are of quarantine. So I think that I'm grateful for those people, for all of them. Amazing. I love that. So good. Um, so I will share, actually, no, let's keep going. Jess, hit it. <laughs> hey, uh, so today I am grateful for the healing power of music and of singing and dancing and creating and the melody of the birds in the background and just the amazing joy that and healing that music brings. So that's amazing. It. Thank you. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that. How about you? You, Andy, what are you thankful for? Hey, I am grateful for summer in Chicago. It's finally here, I believe, in the sun. My health, my family, my beautiful pets, and really this, this wonderful storytelling around the fire. Thank you. Thank you. And Andy, do you want to give uh, everybody a little heads up as to what uh, you're up to and what Feel Real is about while we're gathering some more grateful folks around the fire? Sure, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, yeah, we're our interests are very aligned, I think. We're all about the total and full expression of human emotions as, as part of a full and complete expression of life. So feel real, uh, we are collecting gatherings such as this uh, of all kinds, healing spaces, doodle spaces, spaces where we talk about systemic injustice, you know, all of the things that we think need to be uh, brought together and talked about and felt in order to build a world that's even more beautiful and just than the one we have. Uh, feelreal.net if you want to check it out. Thank you for being here. Oh, I love it. So Feel Real, uh, Andy and I met at a uh, 18 Coffees event in Chicago. It's a business networking group. Um, and I was sharing my story that I shared on tour. We were at Smith Group in Chicago and the day before the day this event started he was like hey are you guys still looking for sponsors like we would love to help you out we'd love to get the word out we want to be a part of it like how can we help um so we're really thankful for you being here today andy and for your support and listing our events with your groups we appreciate you so so much thank you my pleasure thank you absolutely um i saw michelle and nicole it sounded like you guys wanted to Jump in with something you're grateful for. Come on down. Let's see who we got. Nicole, go who you're first. <laughs> Hi guys. Um, so I like totally relate to a lot of things you guys said, especially as growing. I, first of all, I'm grateful for my mom. Like everything she says, I'm just like, yep, I learned that from her. I learned that from her. I learned that from her. And how do I implement that in my life? Cause like in the past she used to be like other people's business is not my business. And in high school, I'm like, what do you mean that's not my business you know but I truly feel that way today and I uh I feel like the last like seven months there's like like since my last breakup like I have so many people that have faith in me and I like don't second guess or question myself anymore and like I'm on to big things because people actually respect what I have to say and like want to share my vision because I honestly am not second guessing everything and everything you guys are saying is like stuff I learned from you guys and I feel that way completely you know, and like, I'm able to look back and be like, oh, wow. Like, you know, for instance, like this is somebody that I used to like look up to and now like they're asking questions for me or my opinion. And I'm like, wow, like I never expected that. 
you know, and I'm just like really grateful for the people in my life. And I'm grateful to have people that constantly are celebrating my brother because like just this past, like just this past week, like I run a nonprofit or I work with a nonprofit um, against like some addictions and stuff. And there's like a lot of people dying, like a lot of people have died in the last week and a half. And it's just like been horrible, horrible, horrible. And I'm just like so grateful that I'm able to help with that. And um, it just makes you think about life. And I'm just like trying to accept the journey and look at the journey and appreciate it while it's happening. Instead of just being like, I want to get to this goal one day and that's it. You know what I mean? Like, I want to appreciate every single thing in my life, every single moment of my life. Like I look at my cats and I'm like, love you. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> I love it. And for everybody that might've missed it, Nicole is Adam's sister. So, uh, no, Linda is his mom, Nicole is his sister, and she's like our little sister too. So thank you for sharing, Nicole. It's so good to see your face. I miss your yes, face you. so much. <laughs> All right, Michelle, what are you thankful for tonight? Um, I'm thankful for my son, Justin, my kiddo right here, eight years old. He's a camera shy. Um, he's the reason <laughs> why I want to get better. I've gone through my physical abuse as a child, I've gone through sexual assault, I've gone through my cervical cancer and so much more. And there's a lot of times where I was ready to throw in the towel because it's been hard, but I have him and he gives me my strength. And that's the reason why I want to get better. He's the reason why I'm still here. yeah I love that that's amazing well I'm thankful for your son too thanks for being here and bringing him on I'm so grateful that he is a good reason for you to stick around and hopefully we'll help you find some more good reasons to stick around as well so thank you for being here Michelle so nice thanks. to see your face who else we got let's see um is that everybody okay so Mary had to jump real quick so I'm going to read Mary's gratitude tonight um Mary says I'm sending my gratitude via chat. Grateful for Linda and Christine sharing their stories. Looking forward to living my dash with unconditional love and looking for the speck of sparkle. So, yay. I love that. Two good takeaways. Living with a speck of sparkle and living your dash. Is there anybody else in the chat that would like to hop on and say what they're grateful for? Do, do, do. Let me see. Looks like we're good. Okay, cool. So let's uh, do a couple housekeeping items here. I will put this screen up. So this is our donation screen. So if you are watching on YouTube, um, join us. Donate now, hikingmyfeelings.org slash give. You can select the amount that you'd like to donate. And as a reminder, this is an event to raise money for the Hiking My Feelings Wilderness Wellness Center. And it's also an event to raise money for the American Diabetes Association and RAIN. Um, if you aren't familiar with my story, I was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes in September 2017, and the American Diabetes Association is an organization that's on a mission to find a cure and also improve the lives of people living with pre-diabetes type 2 and type 1. So 10% of the proceeds from this event will go to the American Diabetes Association, and we're also setting aside 10% of the proceeds to go to RAIN, which is the largest anti-sexual violence organization in the United States. They run a um, sexual assault hotline. So if anybody here listening, watching, catching up at a future date is a survivor of sexual assault and you need someone to talk to, or if along the way on this journey with us during the virtual campfire, you think about that one thing that happened that one time and you wonder if it was assault, the folks at Rain can hop on the phone with you. You can hop in a chat if you're more comfortable with written communications, um, but it's 100% free. They are wonderful, wonderful organization. And so that's why we've decided to set aside 10% of our proceeds to go to RAIN, largely because I didn't know that was a resource that existed when I was sexually assaulted. And as much as I just said, I wouldn't change any of my journey, I really would have liked to have started healing sooner. So for anybody that is in need of support, if you um, go to RAIN.org, you can find out all of their contact information for their chat for their phone calls um, and any other kinds of programs that they have that you may be interested in. So your dollars are going to a good place, American Diabetes Association, RAIN, and also the Hiking My Feelings Wilderness Wellness Center. So thank you in advance for those that have joined us and are part of the virtual campfire in the Zoom meeting. Um, if you're watching on YouTube and you've decided 
yeah, this is something I want to get in on. I want to get in on those good vibes. I want to share what I'm grateful for. I want to ask the guest questions. You can find out all of our different ticket options at hikingmyfeelings.org slash campfire. And we would just love to have you be a part of this. We cannot build this without your support. I do not have $30,000 sitting in my bank account. I'm someday, hopefully soon I will. So I use the Hiking My Feelings bank account so we can go and build this place. Um, that's our first goal. And with that $30,000, what we'll be able to do is build a 32 foot by 32 foot deck. Um, and that's gonna be up the hill. And one of these days I'll figure out a way to show you guys stuff, but it takes a little bit of extra service to get up there. So I'm gonna have to like do some testing. but. Um, on the other side of the mountain up here, we're building a 32 foot by 32 foot deck. And then on top of that, we're putting a 24 foot diameter geodesic dome. And the reason we selected the dome as the structure, um, we had considered a tiny house on wheels. We considered um, a yurt. We looked at container homes and converting those. But in this valley in particular, um, this winter, we experienced a lot of high winds. And this winter in particular, we saw, um, 106 miles per hour as a gust in this valley, which is so fast and very strong. So what we're looking for is a structure that can hold up in those winds, that can serve as a community hub for all of our online programming. So someplace where we can film these things. We do, um, as I mentioned, we have our Blaze Your Own Trail to Self Love program, which I'll be telling you more about on June 3rd. Um, next week on my birthday is when we're going to announce that. But that is a 12-week program which is primarily online with um, guided self-discovery exercises and a hiking training progression. Um, so we'll be able to film all of our stuff there, host all of our um, online programming up there. When we are able to gather safely again, we'll be able to use that space as the like base camp for all of our group hikes, backpacking trips, all of that fun stuff because we have a lot of great trails. We have some trails on the property. We have a lot of great trails within walking distance from the property here at the Reggae Ranch. Um, and also within a quick drive. So thank you so much for being a part of this. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to help more people. Um, as you guys know, this healing is open for everybody. We don't discriminate. We don't cut anybody out. Um, there are people all over the world who are hurting, who are hurting others. I'm sure you've heard the phrase, hurt people, hurt people. Um, we can't turn away people that are hurting just because they haven't found healing. In fact, when people come to us for healing, it is our responsibility to help them find it. And if that means that they're healing with us, great. If we're pointing them towards other resources, also great. But at the end of the day, we believe that everybody should have access to this stuff. And that's why we started this nonprofit organization. So we can utilize funds from different grants, from donors, from people like you, um, who want to see this world develop into a place that's a little bit more kind, where sexual violence has been eradicated and diabetes is no longer an issue. That's the world we're trying to build and we're so thankful for you guys for being a part of it. So thank you for joining us tonight. Um, tomorrow we've got a wild, wild, wild lineup. Um, let me see, I didn't write it down. So I'm just like not prepared on that side of things. I was just so excited about today. So tomorrow we have um, some really awesome folks. We are gonna be talking about um, what it's like to be a woman in a male dominated industry. In fact, several male dominated industries. My first guest tomorrow is Hannah Betts. She's a world, uh, world champion skydiver. She was on the UK women's team um, that won the world meet. So she is like one of the best skydivers in the world. She was also one of my skydiving coaches. And prior to being a skydiver, she was a police officer and then she was a professional skydiver. And now she's a stunt woman in Hollywood. So this gal knows a lot about what it means to be in an environment where men are running the show and how do you show up as a strong female in that space. Um, we're also going to be talking about uh, body image issues because chapter two is all about the first time I went to try on hiking gear and I was just like, I don't even recognize this body. So we're gonna be talking about all of that. We have an incredible guest tomorrow for music. Um, K Bong, Kevin Bong is the stick figure keyboardist. He also is the front man for his own band called K Bong. And he came out to join us this weekend at the Reggae Ranch and hike with us and write some music and just kind of jam and understand what we're doing here with the space, see our vision for the retreat center. And I'm really excited for you guys to hear him sing tomorrow because his lyrics are so uplifting. They're so inspiring. And he's one of those people where like, when you're around him, when you see him on stage, when you're around him in person, you just can't help but like smile and like want to dance a little bit. Like he's just a bucket of good energy. And then 
Um, we also have do 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 do. Yep, I don't know. I'm gonna pull it up. So that's it. I don't have my phone. It's not working. So yay, we're here. I only went over four minutes. I think I said the S word a couple times, but I don't think I dropped an F bomb. So we're killing it. So as of right now, um, we have raised six thousand three hundred seventeen dollars towards our thirty thousand dollar goal. Thank you so much for being here. Um, if anybody has any questions in the Zoom meeting, stick around. I'm going to wrap up the YouTube part, and then we can uh, do a little Q and A here. So thank you so much for joining us and we will see you guys soon. Mm -hmm.